And so we look at those commands of the Lord our God, again from the New Testament, and then in light of the command of temperance. So I invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, and then especially 11 through 14. This is the word of the Lord to us. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is a fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it's been said that the virtues of courage and justice are much lauded. And courage, of course, we can associate with something, right? We see a soldier going off in a war and say, well, there's a courageous man. He's brave. And, and we've got something there, right? Or, or justice, when we see a man in his robes or a woman in her robes and, and she executes the law in a good way, again, there too, there's something we can laud, and, and, and at least for the most part, we think that that's a good thing in our society. But temperance, I guess first of all I should say, what is temperance? It's an old word, and it comes sort of out of our ancient Christian tradition, but it doesn't mean what most people think it means, because most people think temperance has to do with alcohol, and abstinence. So you can talk to our brother, Pastor Greg, because in the United States, temperance was a very big historical reality in the 1920s. And if you read the history of the late 1800s into the turn of the 20th century, alcohol was a massive problem for young men. Women were home alone a lot. Men were spending their time and money not only on beer and alcohol, but all kinds of hooch and moonshine. It was a terrible epidemic. It was so bad that government officials in the churches said, not only do we need to moderate our alcohol consumption, we need to get rid of it. It was that bad of a plight on the land. The United States, the Great Awakening, also had much to do with that. So temperance then, even into the Canada, because it's interesting that Canada never had a temperance movement, except maybe perhaps in the churches, has equaled or is equivocated, <clears throat> excuse me, with abstinence. But temperance historically means moderation. So if you look in, I'll use Webster's this afternoon, moderation in action, in thought, or in feeling, and then they have it all in caps, restraint. A, habitual moderation in the indulgence of appetites or passions, and then moderation or abstinence in the form of the use of alcoholic beverages. But that's really what it means, a, a restraint, but maybe better to say a proper use of the good things that God has given us in an appropriate way and in an appropriate time. Because really what the sin of gluttony is, and that's what this is all about, the answer to the sin of gluttony is when we take the good things of Almighty God and we overindulge. So the old Latin word, for gluttony is luxuria. It's very much a first world problem. People who are starving, people who live in very poor countries, don't worry so much about gluttony because there's nothing to glut on. But as we move into a first world place, there's lots of food, and there's lots of booze, and there's lots of drugs, and there's lots of good things for us to abuse and to overindulge. So if you think about it, I don't think in, in, in some third world countries, and if we look around the world, that dietary industry is, is a mass industry in these countries where you can't get enough to eat. And yet, how many diets do we not see in Canada and the United States? And it's interesting, even in Europe, I talk to Europeans sometimes, and they're like, what is it with you North Americans? 
Why do you need all of these diets? Well, it's because we overindulge. We have lots, and we make use of it, and then we abuse it. So I don't want, again, to spend a whole lot of time on gluttony. We'll spend a little bit of time on it in terms of the virtue of temperance, or if you like, moderation. But what's at stake here? Well, at stake here, of course, is is excessiveness. And then what comes against it, excessiveness, as we said, is the proper use of these things. So the Greco-Roman society was hedonistic, and hedonistic simply means the pursuit of pleasure. What makes me happy? Even the United States, right, has it in their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. My happiness. What makes me happy? Now, when you add to that this idea that the, that the soul is kind of generally a good thing and that generally the soul needs to be taken care of and the way you do that is through your physical appetites, then you begin to see that there is, at least in their thinking, and I think also in, in much of the world's thinking, this idea that, that the body has these appetites and they affect the soul. And there's some truth to that, although I, I hope we can do deeper because we're people of the living God. But when we were created good and in the image of God and we became like God, that meant we became simple. Now, I know for many of you, simple means how you think of me. The guy's not too bright. But simple actually means purity. So remember when Richard talked about gold, that our faith would be refined as pure as gold. It gets rid of everything in so that all that is left is the gold. It's pure. So the purity would be the image of God. That as God is simple, God is not made up of all kinds of parts. God is pure and whole in all that he does, and we were pure and whole in all that we did. And then when we fell into sin, the purity was ruptured between us and God. And as we've read in Romans, between you and me, love your neighbor as yourself, we need to be commanded to do that, but also within yourself. O wretched man that I am, Paul writes in Romans chapter 7. I'm kind of at war with myself, and you are when you come to Jesus Christ. I want to be who I am not. And I want to be what I cannot be without the Holy Spirit. So even when you come to faith, even when you are converted, the the conversion begins with the work of Jesus Christ, which is finished, but he's not finished with you. And so Paul writes to the Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Ephesians, to the Colossians about gluttony, drunkenness, about getting stoned, about overeating, about obesity, and all of those things that go together. Now Aristotle understood his time and the Stoics of the Romans' times that we need to moderate. We need to start getting control of ourselves. And it's interesting that a lot of times when we talk about the abuse of things, we make it an animalistic behavior, right? The guy eats like a pig or he drinks like a fish, which is really disrespectful to animals because animals just do what they do. You know what the problem is? We're depraved. The problem is it's us. We're not drinking and eating like humans are supposed to eat and drink. So to compare ourselves to animals is really inappropriate. The problem is there's something wrong with us and we need to discipline the self And then normally what they appealed to, and Aristotle did this as well, was to say, look at what you're doing to your body. You're slamming 15 cans of Coke into yourself and you're wondering why you've got blood sugar problems and why you've got a little pot over there. We went out for dinner last night and and we saw at the restaurant, it said, "A, a full belly makes the pleasure of life. Well, there's truth to that. But when the belly gets bigger, it takes a whole lot more to find that pleasure in life doesn't it? So there's certain truth about that, right? Like gluttony does bring a lot of problems. So we know that right now, it used to be smoking, right? was kind of the number one cause of cancer and death. It isn't anymore. It's overeating. And overeating causes, obviously, high blood pressure, organs to shut down, But it's even the knees begin to carry all that weight. I don't move like I used to. I don't uh, work like I used to. I, I can't do the things I used to do. I'm more tired. I don't have the same energy. But drinking now, they're finally pointing out, which is interesting, over over last summer and this summer again, reports have come out what we used to think is moderate drinking is actually killing us. And they're finally saying it. 
booze is leading to hypertension, blood pressure issues, heart attacks, organ shutdown, kidney failure, liver failure, diabetes, and now they're saying it's linked to a number of kinds of cancer. And they used to say, you know, a glass of beer a day. Now they're saying no more than three glasses of beer a week. After that, you're actually overindulging. It's interesting, isn't it? And now we begin to start seeing that maybe I'm not a glutton in the sense that you can see it on me or that it's necessarily having great big effect, but we start to wonder, am I using the things of God the way God wanted me to use them? And that's why we need to go deeper than Aristotle. The Vikings had a word for moderation, and the, and the short form of the word is moderation, but the larger word for moderation in the Viking language is for the group. How do I eat and drink? That was especially for them, for the group. So when the Vikings came and attacked, and when it was fighting season, they ate a certain way. But after the attack and victory, they ate another way. So they understood there was a way to eat, to do the work we're called to do, and there's a way to eat and drink for celebration. And now we're getting into some of the things that the Bible speaks to as well, that food and drink does have a celebratory aspect to it. It's, it's not wrong to take pleasure in food. You see, the beauty of Christianity is when we finally learn to live for Christ, and by the way, taking pleasure and worship and going to a wedding and having a good food and drink or celebrating a birthday is part of the Christian life in a way that we bring glory to God. It's just that we shouldn't be doing it all the time. So when we start thinking, well, what's the group we're part of? Well, we're the group called the church. And as the cadet hymn goes, the group that's called the church is to live for Jesus the life that is true. So one of the writers uh, that I read was talking about, and interesting, right at the Olympics are going on right now in Tokyo. Do you think most of the athletes are running around going, oh, I can't eat this and I can't eat this and et cetera, et cetera, or that they're eating very poorly? No, they eat in a certain way because they've gone there for a purpose and the purpose is to win a gold medal or whatever it is. And then at the end of the day, they will eat and they will drink when it's appropriate. So that makes sense to us, but we still got to go deeper because we are the new creatures in Christ. It can't just be sort of this horizontal, well, it makes more sense for me not to drink too much and not to eat too much and not to use too many drugs. No, we are to live in the service and the glory of Almighty God. And so then we get to our text because our text answers these things. So maybe you're not struggling with the sin of gluttony. But I think you probably know somebody who is if you're not. And then, like we saw last time, to just tell somebody don't isn't enough. You see, what gluttony does is to take a physical thing to fill a spiritual emptiness. And what could be more disappointing? It is the great deception. You know, what can be more disappointing after eating a great big meal and my belly is full and then I'm still sad? Or after a couple of beers and a couple of shots, and I'm sitting there and I'm more depressed than when I started. Now what do you do? Like I can tell you that most alcoholics that I know who have recovered have gotten to the point where I can't be happy without drinking and I'm completely unhappy when I'm drinking. And then God just slams you down and you've got nowhere else to go except up into him. And you hear Jesus say, come unto me, you who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And a church that says, come to us, you who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And then people in the church are counselors and people to help you, because quite often when gluttony turns into addiction, you're going to need help. And all of those things, we start then with the beauty and the marvel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for love fulfills the law. Love does no harm to a neighbor. And if that's true, then love does no harm to oneself. If it's love your neighbor as yourself, you're harming yourself. Why would you do that? Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. Gluttony seems like you're loving yourself, but in fact, you're not. There's some reason that you're hating yourself. And do this understanding the present time. And then I want to get down to 
verse 13, or rather verse 12, let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness. So those two are really our gluttonous passage. In sexual immorality, which we dealt with last time, and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus and do not. So put on, take off. Clothe yourself, put off the deeds of darkness. Live as the children of light. So let's find some context to that. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we find that. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be transformed in the renewing of your mind. Now, how can we... Well, what does he say? I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. So now we're back where we were last time. We have to start not with the law, but with the love of Almighty God. And Paul has just been making the amazing point of how God sent his son to die for the faithful Israelites and now engrafted the faithful Gentiles into this body called the church, and Christ died for us. I urge you in light of God's mercy, in light of his grace, in light of his love, if he did this for you, and now he says live this way, why wouldn't you listen to him? We sang it together. Lord, your radiant commands are pure, and they help us see what is the good, what is the pleasing will of Almighty God. It is to accept that on our own, our lives are unmanageable. It is to accept that the moment that we want to be God, it will end ultimately in hell and destruction. But if God has called you into his light on this earth, it will end in some sort of disaster, some sorrow, something that happens that drives you to your knees so that you cry out to Jesus, I've heard your call, heavenly Savior. And I bring my burdens. I'm heavy laden. I need your rest. Give me your yoke. Here's my yoke. Don't be conformed to the world. The world's got nothing for you. I mean, Rome wasn't so different than Greece. And the Greco-Roman world is exactly like Toronto. Are you feeling lousy? I eat. Have a tub of ice cream. How many of you ever really crave really good food? And I don't mean good taste. I mean food that's good for you. I can't remember the last time that I came home from a consistory meeting and thought, you know what would be good? A couple of carrots and some celery. Where are the chips? Where are those carbs? Where's the salt? Where's the sugar? It's about getting taste. And you know why that is? Because those things, when properly used, create dopamine and we feel good. But really, how often do I come home from a consistory meeting and just go on my hands and knees in prayer to God for a little while and say, Lord God, what was good, thank you. What we need to do better, go there. And then pick up the rest of the night. And I'll tell you, before that, it was a drink. And I think a lot of office bearers, too many, and I can tell you it even happens at our synod, are too quick to have a beer and too quick to have a drink. It becomes beyond fun after a while. I can't go to sleep or I, I need it to settle down. And the beautiful thing about Dutch people, you know, they never have a big drink, they only have a little one. And borrelche, right, the little diminutive at the end. Why is that? Because we've learned that from the world. That's what the world tells us. That this is fun, this is good, this is what's going to help us. And by the way, what's interesting about certain immigrant uh, societies, they come to Canada, it's interesting that as they assimilate and then as they become wealthy, they can afford these things. And now you have the ability to have them. So we think, why has God saved us? To be part of the communion of the saints. So we read then in Romans 13 again, that do this understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we believe the night is nearly over, the day is almost here, let's put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Well, when do you need armor? When you're in a fight. We're not going to walk around in armor when we're out at the beach 
or when we're in the cottage or at the end of the day, it's when we're fighting. Do you understand you're in a fight? Now, I'm going to say this, and it might even seem trite to you, but do you eat and do you drink like a soldier of the cross? Do you eat and drink? And I'm, by the way, under this too, and I'm going to tell you I don't enough. But do we eat and drink so that I've got your back in the fight? Because the guy who's half in the bag cannot come to your house when you need him, when you cry out for help. Are we giving the example to our children in the way that we eat, that we are in a fight? And then when we use the devil's weaponry and take it on for ourselves, excessive eating and drinking that makes us lethargic, that slows the mind, that dulls us so that we pretty soon are, are not aware even of our sin anymore, he's got us. Put on the armor of light. Put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You can't just, I think that's the the beautiful thing about the Bible. The Bible never just tells you to stop doing something. It always tells you, well, if you're going to stop doing this, you need to do that. So you look at those words there, right? It says, and clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. When gluttony takes over, you begin to be dominated. What am I going to eat? When's supper time? Do I got enough beer in the fridge? And you begin to think about, you know, the liquor store is going to close. I, I, I better get going. Or, or it's a holiday weekend. Do I have enough? To, you begin to be consumed by that which you are consuming. It becomes a God. Don't think about those things. But I can't help but think about those things. Think about living for Jesus. One of the problems with gluttony is free time. What do you do with your free time, honestly? Well, we have a barbecue, and we have people over, and we eat. Nothing wrong with that. But how often do we use our free time to talk to our neighbor for a minute, to spend some time in study? And I mean, I know this sounds over pious, but really, beloved, how often do we spend our free time to make us better soldiers? We have become the eight to ten hour work of days and I just got to relax. I've earned it. I've earned the right to a good food and, and, and something to eat and something to drink. And yet the devil takes no time off. And it feels more and more like the world is not taking any time off. You can go to the bar all day and all night. You can get whatever you want all day and all night. But are we living as people who are putting on the armor of light. And again, it really has to do with a decision. A decision that can only come through the converting power of the Holy Spirit in your life. But once you have that, that, that fight is going to be, but do we really think about fighting the good fight for Jesus Christ all the time? You know, the Israelites had the law of the first, right? The first fruits. So the first uh, part of the crop, usually 10% was given to the Lord. The oldest son was dedicated to the Lord, etc. But they also had the first part of the day was to be spent with the Lord. And there's something beautiful with that. Now I was going to, in the sermon I wrote, in the morning when you get up, but a lot of you work shifts. So at the beginning of your day, after you're finished sleeping, and at the beginning of your time, are we spending time with the Lord to say, Lord, I want to be a better soldier. Lord, I've been eating way too much and I'm not being that kind of soldier. And by the way, again, speaking from personal experience, when when consumed by alcohol and you're on your hands and knees, Lord God, release me from the alcohol. Mr. Groot and I were talking about the building. But you can't just pray, Lord, make the roof better. We got to call a roofing company. We can't just say, Lord, make the door better. You got to call somebody to fix the door. And you can't just pray, Lord God, get me out of alcoholism and then wait for a miracle to happen. Yeah, that's fine, son, but you got to go do something. You're involved with this. Come to me, but I'll send you the people you need to go to. And are you willing to go to it? 
Are you willing to humble yourself? Are you willing to give it all up because you've not been a good soldier, admit you've not been a good soldier, and now go and do the things that you need to do to be the good soldier? That starts with prayer, but it's ora et labora, pray and work. And when the two come together, what begins to happen is the body and the soul now become in harmony with the will of Almighty God. So, you know, I think we talk about that, right, quite a bit. I think even in the church that, that drunkenness happens or that gluttony happens because it's a, it's a bodily passion, right? It's a physical passion. I'm hungry, so I eat, and then I eat too much, right? <clears throat> but C.S. Lewis writes, and I'm paraphrasing here, and, and, he, and he hasn't much longer, but he has this conversation between the soul and the body, and the soul, after a night of partying and carousing, is feeling lousy and feeling all ashamed, it kind of says to the body, well, if it wasn't for you making me eat so much and if it wasn't for you with all your passions and desires for drinking and the body says, hey, look, the first time we had a shot of whiskey, I rejected it. We hated it. I almost gagged and threw up, but you kept throwing it in me. And then after you did drink too much, I actually reacted by having a hangover and a headache and you still kept doing it. And when you kept filling me with food, I said, look, we've got acid indigestion here. And then I began to swell up. And then I began to show, I've been physically showing you the whole time that this is no good for you. But when we become soldiers of light and we say, how do I live for Christ? How do I live my life responsibly? So as we read then in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, whatever you eat, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do we live, I mean, Eating so mundane, right? We, we hardly think about it, right? I mean, mothers quite often have to think about what are we going to feed my children. That's quite different than about what am I going to get to eat. Most of us don't eat because it's good for us or how are we going to be as healthy as possible. We eat because it tastes good. It brings us some comfort. It brings us some pleasure. And again, we're not saying that that's wrong, but when celebratory eating becomes constantly the way of eating, then you know what actually happens? That eating, and part of the joy of eating and drinking, is fellowship. But when we become consumed by it, you actually become isolated. So drunks drink alone, and gluttons eat alone. Because I don't want you to see me. I'm ashamed of the way that I eat. But in Christ, what does Christ give to us? Bread and wine, a table, a feast. Eat and drink. Remember and believe. Think of the words of Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food, a banquet of aged wine for all people, the best of the meat, meaning the fat part of the meat, the best tasting part of the meat, and the finest of wines. And at the end of time, what are we going to do? We're going to go to a wedding feast. Feasts are part of life. Celebration is a part of life. We get to enjoy that wonderful part of life because we're experienced praise and honor of God and we want to do that with one another. There's something communal, something great. Eating and drinking then becomes part of the way that we as soldiers bolster one another and reflect upon the victory of Christ with one another. But then there's also times when we're eating and drinking so that we remain healthy and fit that we exercise, although I was reading about this, there's a gluttony of our exercising now where people kind of overdose on uh, adrenaline and need that all the time. You know, the Lord God has given us medicines and they help us to be better soldiers so that we're not always fighting with back pain or other things. Medicine is very good that helps us to remain healthy and then pretty soon we abuse it. So that as much as a problem as meth and crack and Marijuana is, we have a massive problem with tranquilizers and oxycodone and all that kind of stuff, which you can buy right here in the streets of Rexdale. All these good things warped. All of these good things given to us by Almighty God, and then we need to lead the way. We need to start thinking about this light that God has given us. And remember what we said last week from 1 Corinthians 6? Do you not know your bodies? are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You're not your own. You were bought with the price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. 
Yes, as Paul says, there's a tension in there, but with Christ and in Christ and with each other and with this sense of the purpose for which we have been called, we can overcome these temptations, we can overcome these sins, and we can enjoy food properly, we can use food properly and alcohol properly and medicine properly, understanding for someone like me, alcohol is a thing of the past, but for you, you can enjoy it. And use it wonderfully. And that's good. But we do not have to be controlled by it. We do not have to be controlled by our lusts. Look, if you're sad, or you're broken, you're having trouble with sleeping, you're hurting, take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to a brother and sister. Talk about it. Go to a Christian counselor. But please don't go to the fridge. Please don't go to the LCBO. Look at what happened in Toronto. The LCBO has been selling liquor at Christmas and New Year's levels for 18 months. What did the government say? You can't go out, but you can drink all you want. In Rexdale, there's now five marijuana stores. How do we need five marijuana stores? But those are all open. Even when we couldn't buy certain things like shoes for the children, you could buy all of those things. Why? I don't know why the government lets it, but I know that there's a satanic, I will keep these people under that control. And I can tell you that people falling off the wagon for alcoholism is out the roof. People turning to fentanyl in the city is a problem. It's it's very difficult to get people into detox because there's so many people into detox here in Toronto. It took us three weeks to get a friend in. It's bad. So we need to say not only don't, but here's where you can go. And to teach them and to show them in the way that we live. Because it is the big lie. As one writer put it, when you dine with the devil, gluttony, it's a big pot. But when you get to the bottom of the pot and there's nothing there for your soul anymore, you'll look to the devil and he's way over there, he's gone. The devil does not love us. The devil hates us. Anything he says is good for us isn't good for us. Let's not be conformed to the world. Be transformed in the renewing of your lives. Look, you're closer today than you were yesterday to the day of your salvation. How long do we have? How much time are we going to waste eating and drinking too much? So let's stop all that and let's get ourselves ready and prepared for the fight. How much time do we spend getting ready for it, preparing, and and not always just reading and preparing and knowing more, but then sharing it. To spend time in the neighborhood. To spend time with other people and say, you know what, I've seen that lady five times, six times this week. It's time for me to talk and start that relationship because I have the time. And I was just going to eat a bag of chips anyways. And it changes everything, right? The beauty of Christianity is all of those things that are of God which are good. When God made the heavens and the earth, including man, Adam and Eve, and he said it was very good. And what did he create? Be fruitful and multiply, man and woman, in relationship of intimacy And he says, I give you the trees and the fruit of the trees so that you can be taken care of. And not only was that food good for nourishment, but it was pleasing to the eye. And then you look what we've done with all of of these things. And so, beloved, let us live as children of light. Let us walk in decent behavior, Everything, maybe even moderation or temperance, maybe we ought to say everything in an appropriate way to the situation and to the gift that God has given us. Always remembering that we were bought in a price. And if you are struggling, as we've said one more time, run to Jesus, run to someone in the church, and run to someone who can help you. Because you do not have to be enslaved to these things anymore. It is so. Eternal Spirit, God of truth, our contrite heart inspire. Ignite a flame of heavenly love 
and feed the pure desire. Run to the Savior now. He gently calls you. Amen. Father in heaven, help us when we struggle with our passions and our appetites. Lord, there's so much good food and drink. There's so many things to dazzle the soul and tickle the tongue and amaze us. But what could amaze us more than you? And all the good things you've given to us. Let us be self-disciplined. Let us be soldiers of the cross. Let us live for Jesus, the life that is true. And Father in heaven, we pray that you would fill our hearts and inspire us to love the things that you have given to us. That you would subdue the power of every sin, whatever that sin may be, that we in singleness and simpleness of heart may worship only you. In Jesus' name, amen.